sins were nailed into your sinless hands. Oh, I know that you gave it all for me. Jesus Christ hung on top of Calvary. I'm in love with my God, my King His love is alive, it burns within me Every beat of my heart will sing Your love is alive, it burns within me I'm in love with my God, my King His love is alive, it burns within me Every beat of my heart will sing Your love is alive, it burns within me
Good morning. Welcome to Every Nation Church, Malaysia. Thank you for joining us. Well, if you have been with us for the past few weeks, we want to thank you for coming again online. In fact, if you enjoyed your time with us, smash that like button. Or if you want to get fancy, smash those Facebook emojis. If it's your first time with us, stick around for details. We would want to engage with you. You know, part of our church vision is to honor God. And we can honor God this morning by participating in our worship, participate in our giving, and participate in listening to the Word. Let's not get distracted, distracted by whatever is happening on Facebook or in whatever social platforms we may be, and let's give God the best that He deserves. Talking about worship, I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old at home. And whenever they hear something familiar coming out from this house, any type of music that we sing, they are locked in. They are engaged. They just want to worship God as well. And I hope we have the same spirit as well. You know, it reminds me of a scripture in Psalms 8 verse 2, where it says that from the lips of infants, you have ordained praises. In fact, let me read you another translation from the Passion Translation, where it says, You have built a stronghold by the songs of babies. Strength rises up with the chorus of singing children. This kind of praise has the power to shut Satan's mouth. Childlike worship will silence the madness of those who oppose you. You know, this morning, let's not give God just any type of worship, but let's give God the type of worship that He deserves. Not just any type, not weak worship, but powerful worship. Powerful enough to shut the mouth of the enemy. So let's start with, let's start with worship. Let me pray for you guys. Father, we thank you for everything that's happening. We thank you that you are still in control. We thank you that you know our needs. And we want to give you all the praise that you deserve because you are worthy of it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship. Lord, we thank you, God, that we can come here, God, to praise and worship you today, God. Lord, we pray that every tribe of God will come together and give you the praise that you deserve, God, because you deserve all praise at all times, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Maker God.
Thank you, worship team, for an amazing time of reconnecting us with God through praise and worship. And hello to you! Welcome to Every Nation Church Malaysia Online. We are a church that exists to honor God and make disciples. And if you're watching this video via our Facebook or YouTube channel, remember to click follow or subscribe to get to know who we are and for the latest updates. And if you're here for the first time, scan right here on this QR code to claim your surprise welcome gift. And as always, we would like to get to know you. So check out this video to get to know us. Thank you for the video. So if you need someone to pray for you or someone to talk to, we hope to see you at hdmd.la slash connect right after service. So here are a few announcements before the message for today. As you know, Every Nation Church Malaysia is a global movement, and this year we are running a global edition Purple Book. In this series of 12 sessions, you will get a chance to hear and learn from different leaders of our Every Nation global family. So grab a Purple Book and sign up to find out more. Next, do mark your calendars because we are celebrating Father's Day next weekend. This is our chance to invite our dads or dad figures as we honor them in church. Pastor Russ from South Point Community Church will be our guest speaker next Sunday and you don't want to miss it. And finally, an important announcement for the parents online. Kids Church has just launched their own online link, so starting from this week, you can click on this link after service, hgmd.la slash everynationkids to join us at Kids Church Online. And that's all the announcements as we continue with the sermon series titled Once Upon a Time. Join me as we invite our senior pastor, Pastor Timothy, to bring out yet another biblical story and truth of life. Good morning, church. Uh, it's really an exciting time again that we are able to gather every weekend just to hear from God's Word and to allow the Word of God to minister and to refresh us and to convict our hearts. Uh, we have been on this series called Once Upon a Time, Life-Changing Stories That Jesus Told. You know, stories are so powerful. The most powerful story that I know that how God uses a story to change someone's life uh, was really the story of King David. So if you, if you remember the story, 1 Samuel talks about how King David sinned against God and he, he kept the sin secret for quite a while. Some people, once they calculated according to the information of the Bible given, was he kept it for about nine months and some even suspected that it goes about a year. But you know what was interesting was, it was Prophet Nathan who came one day and use a story and a story of a rich person who has so many lambs, but instead he went to a poor person and gotten the very one lamb that this person has. And the Bible, when David heard about it, he was indignant. And then that's when Prophet Nathan said, that man is actually you. Using a story to bring King David to the spot of repentance, a conviction in their heart. You know, when we design once upon a life, uh, once upon a time, we design that every weekend, we pray that there's a shift in your heart. There is an alignment. Uh, there is something that happens deep within you. There's a conviction that comes from heaven, comes from God that will move us so that we align our lives according to what the Bible says. So uh, once upon a time, we kind of have gone through that for about five weekends. Uh, this is the sixth one and we have two more to go. Uh, so we're going to make it all together, eight weekend kind of a messages, all right? Now, uh, what are parables? Parables are really heavenly truth in earthly stories. In every parables, there are three things, uh, three ingredients, I call it. Number one, 
it has what we call common life metaphors, something that all of us can understand. So for King David, uh, there was a story of a shepherd and an owner that has a lot of sheep. Everyone can understand that. Number one, it has common life metaphors. Number two, it has a contrast. It always shows you the contrast between someone that's rich and someone that's very poor. And that it has a central truth so that it can convey that. So last five weekends, we have done uh, all five of them. And I'm just going to walk through with you and bring about using that three greets that I talk about. Uh, first of all, we started with the parabise, parable of the wise and foolish builder. Uh, what was the common life metaphor of building, building a house? What was the contrast? A wise and a foolish builder. What was the central theme? The central theme is that you need to build your foundation strong so that you live a storm-proof life. And that foundation is really the foundation of Jesus. Then the next week, we talk about the parables of the rich fool. What was the metaphor? Uh, building bands, uh, business growing, purchasing even more. And in that little story, what was the contrast? The contrast between someone who thought he is wise, but the Bible says he is fool. And what was the little truth? The Bible tells us that you want to watch out for all kinds of greed and be rich towards God. And then we did the parables of the persistent widow, right? A widow applying, wanting to get things approved. It's a very common metaphor. What was the contrast between a wicked judge, a judge that is heartless and a God that is extremely merciful? That was the contrast. What was the key truth? It wants to tell us that you are coming to God. Thus, you shouldn't give up and you should always pray and do not lose heart. Then we did the fourth parable, which is the parable of the talents. <coughs> it's a story of a master that went away. Uh, the metaphor, he went away and he entrusted his possession uh, to three different uh, stewards. And uh, what was the contrast? How each of them took care and the contrast was between a faithful servant and an unfaithful servant. It wasn't the amount, it was how faithful you are. What was the key truth? That God measures faithfulness. Ultimately, it's faithfulness that brings us to greater things in life. And then last weekend, Eugene did an outstanding job, the parable of the unforgiving servant. Uh, what, was the, what was the metaphor? What was the life metaphor? Well, people owing debts. Uh, all of us understand that because we go through that. What was the contrast? You have someone who owes so much and then was forgiven and someone who owes so little and the very person whom was just forgiven refused to forgive the other person. That was that little contrast. What was the central truth? The central truth is that uh, you first of all need to experience the forgiveness of God and then you be a forgiver. When you think about forgiving others, it's not how much they owe you, it's that God has forgiven you for the debts that you couldn't pay, and out of that, you forgive others. So that has always been that little journey that we have taken. Today on the week six, we're going to do the parable of the ten virgins. It's a metaphor of a wedding. What was the contrast? It was trying to show uh, five foolish virgin and five wise virgin. They were bridesmaid. We'll come to that shortly. But what was the key truth? The key truth is that are you ready to meet God? Are you ready to meet our Saviour? Are you ready to meet uh, our Lord Jesus Christ when He comes again? All right, that was the key truth. You know, talking about readiness, all of us in our life, we have those little moments that we experience where we were not ready and then we were caught unprepared and then we kind of suffered through a little bit of consequences and understand the emotion and the feeling of not, uh, not prepared. A couple of stories, you know, so there were moments in my life I experienced that. I remember uh, for my wife, there was one time, I think it was her third year, uh, if I'm not mistaken, or her second year. So what happened was uh, it was exam and she saw the wrong timetable. She thought the exam was in the afternoon. Uh, but actually went in the morning. So everybody went for the exam. When it comes to afternoon, I had lunch with her. She was happily. She went to the exam hall and realized nobody was there and the door was shut. Then only she found out that actually the exam was over. You know, that little misinformation. And I still remember she was so distraught. And obviously because of I, who love her and minister to her, so, you know, kind of uh, just strengthened her a little bit, okay? Uh, I... I remember for me, I had a big moment where uh, I wasn't ready. And that was about three, four years ago, I was supposed to go to Guam. And uh, what happened was, I'm, I'm supposed to check in in the morning. 
and then uh, take the flight, go to Philippines, Manila, and reach there about 3 o'clock. And I still have almost about 6 to 7 hours. In fact, I contacted Pastor Michael Padera and said, I'm going to be in Manila, maybe you can catch up a little bit. And then before I took the flight, and then fly over to Guam. Uh, so what happened was I was happily, I went to the airport and I, I, I went on board, you know, all those I had my passport with me. But what I forgot was my visa was in my old passport. You know how that worked out, right? So the visa was in my old passport, which I forgotten to take. And somehow, when I checked in, nobody checked. So I was already on the plane and the plane was about to take off when they were doing their final count. I thought about, I think I didn't have my visa. So I called the flight attendant. I said, I, 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 my apology. I said, I don't think I have a visa. I have my new passport, but my visa is not in it. Immediately, the flight attendant told me, no way, no way, you will be bothered. You need to come down right now. You need to make a decision. So on that spot, I make a decision. I walk down. And the moment I walk out from the plane, which means they have to go to my luggage, they have to go to the plane, all the luggage uploaded, they have to take it down. I'm going to delay the plane. You know, walking through that house with every eyes looking at me, that's a scary uh, scenario. You know? But anyway, I kind of walked out and then, you know, then they took out my luggage and I have to re-look through the entire flight. Cut a long story short, I managed to book the flight at about in the evening, 7 o'clock which means I will reach Manila at about midnight and enough time for me to catch the flight to go to Guam. Uh, the variance is about an hour. Uh, so I, I was come down, you know, and then my wife came, took my old visa. I still remember we had lunch at Burger King, you know, to thank her for that. And uh, after that lunch, you know, she kind of comforted me, you know, all those things. And then, uh, lo and behold, the flight was postponed. So now what happened is, uh, by the time I rushed to the flight and arrived at Manila, the moment I touched down is the moment the flight flew to Guam. So I have to then be stranded and spend a night in Manila. And guess what? They lost my luggage. So everything that can happen in a particular trip happened. No visa, luggage loss, and I'm supposed to do something immediately in Guam, you know, so cut a whole long story short. They have to rebook my fly, you know, and I, by the time I go to Guam, I was just on time to show up and to do what I needed to do and then have the rest of the meeting. And uh, thank God they found my luggages, you know, all those things. But you know, Murphy Law, when something happened, no. So every one of us understand when you are unprepared over something and then something happened and then the amount of work you need to do. You know what? All the story that I told you about uh, we are not ready or we thought we were ready, then we are not ready until reality check comes is that those things cost us but it doesn't cost us that much because ultimately we can redeem back. So for my wife, she then took a second seating though her grade has to be lowered down because there's a huge discount. Uh, but anyway, she passed with, uh, you know, flying colours as well. Uh, for me, I was able to get everything and still go to Guam and do everything that I needed to do. Maybe with a little bit of extra payment I need to have, but I was able to redeem. But today, as we talk about, are you ready to meet God? Are you ready to meet your Creator? Are you ready to meet your Saviour? Uh, the Bible says this is one and only time. And if you miss the boat, you miss the boat. If you are not ready for the Savior, for eternity, the Bible says, uh, you will not be ready for it now. So this is what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ came in His first coming 2,000 years ago. He came as someone who was servers. He came as a servant. Uh, he was humble. He sat on donkey. He died at the cross so that He can be a Savior to every one of you. But in His second coming, the Bible says He's going to come as a King of Kings. He's going to come as a judge, as a ruler. Uh, to bring forth two things, to bring salvation uh, to all who are righteous, to reward the righteous one, and then to judge the unrighteous one in his final and in his second coming that is going to happen. Now, uh, the concept of judgment is not something that this generation particularly like. Uh, in fact, one interesting fact that I found out is, as I, as I help people to discover God, I found out a lot of young people, they don't think about the future. So when you talk about there's, there's going to be a day where you're going to be judged by God, they look at me and say, Pastor, we don't worry. We just worry about today. We, we are worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. We, we don't think so far. So let the future worry by itself. I, I want to kind of challenge you to think differently. And this is how I'm going to do it. You know, when we think about judgment, right, every one of us has a sense of justice in us. Am I correct? 
Uh, so when you are a kid, uh, you have that sense of justice. So I, I see that play out every time in my family. So whenever one of my kids, for example, are grounded for computer, immediately they will say, but that, that, what about, what about, what about the other person? Because he also played overtime. He needs to be grounded as well, right? We have that sense of, you know, justice. So when, sometimes when we come back and say, dad, dad, you know, uh, you know, you must punish so and so because this is what he did to me. This is what he said to me. You know, this is what she said. You know, we have that sense of justice. <clears throat> When you go to campus, you have the sense of justice. You, you found out that someone actually cheated. That sense of justice is, you know, can I report? Can I just bring everybody back to the same playing field? I know that life is never fair, but the sense of justice is that when you go for your working adult, you have the sense of justice. When someone is promoted, where you felt you put in much more effort, you know, we all go through all of that. In fact, this season, and I'm sure you read about it a couple of days ago, there was a uh, highly political guy who was acquitted for 40 over bribery charges and the sense of justice say, God, is that fair? Right now, the entire uproar in America uh, because of George Floyd and what has happened and the sense of justice and the riots and everything. I know, I know it can be politic, uh, politicized, it can has a historical record towards it, but my point is this, every one of us has a sense of justice. You know that sense of justice is given by who? By God. God made us like that because He is like that. Which means that when I see things that supposedly to be fair, when justice is something that I try to bring about but it's beyond my power, the Bible says the day will come when God is going to judge everyone. For everyone will be brought to that judgment day. And that's what this parable is trying to prepare every one of us. So when the day comes, you and I are ready. I'm going to give you a scripture that tells you why Judgment Day, uh, it is so clear biblically. Okay, I'm going to read Acts chapter 17, verse 31. Okay, so if you have your Bible, turn with me. The Bible, it says here, okay, for it says, for, it, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, which is Jesus Christ. And then he says, he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. This is actually the entire discourse that Paul had with the people in Areopagus in Greek, where they had an inscription called the unknown God. So Paul took about uh, 8 to 10 verses to describe to them who, the, uh, who this unknown God is. And at the end of this particular passage, he ends by telling them that this unknown God one day is going to judge all of us. He says, how do you know that this unknown God is really known, is really real? He says, because this unknown God or this God has actually risen up Jesus, has raised up Jesus Christ from the dead as a proof that one day this will definitely take place. You know, the resurrection is something that you need to check it out. If you are watching this for the first time, I want you to know the claim of Christianity is not the teaching of Christ, but it's really the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that was an incredible, uh, incredible event that took place. So you want to check that out. So how do you know that Judgment Day will surely come? If you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then Judgment Day is something the Bible says is for sure it's going to happen. So let's kind of zoom into the parables. I know I was a bit lengthy, but I tried to lay that little foundation. So Matthew chapter 24 and 25 is what we're going to talk about, especially Matthew 25. So Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 is what we call the Olivet Discourse. Right? So I, I hope you learn a new term. So tomorrow we'll meet other older Christians and say, have you heard of Olivet Discourse? If they don't know then, you know, maybe you, you felt a little bit smarter for that moment. Okay, but Olivet Discourse was Jesus personally in Mount Olive. He gave his own teaching about his second coming. So it's like Sermon on the Mount, but this is focusing on his second coming where Jesus personally tell what is going to happen. So uh, the whole story was that they were at Mount Olive Temple, you know, just nearby. And then uh, the disciples asked, asked Jesus, says, Jesus, when are you going to come back again? And then Jesus then began to tell them and gave them four little hints or signs of his coming. And that's Matthew chapter 24. And then he ends by telling about four parables in Matthew chapter 4, 1, and then in Matthew 25, three parables for them to prepare for the coming. And Matthew 25, the parables of the Virgin that we're going to look into is one of those parables to prepare them for His coming. Uh, just give you four little summary in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, Jesus kept on telling the people, He says, no one know 
when I'm going to come? He says, only the Father knows. And then uh, he tells them that you need to be watchful, need to be watchful, need to be watchful. Keep on telling them that. But he tells them four little signs. I'm going to give it to you. Uh, one day when we do that little chapter, we can talk through in detail. But he gave them four little signs. So if you want to take down note, uh, you want to do so. Number one, he gave them signs that were happening in the world. He says that there'll be more famine, more war, more earthquake. He says when you see all that is happening, which is what we see it every day, more war, more earthquake, uh, more famine. The Bible says that the end has not come yet. That's just the beginning of the birth pang, which means that it's just the beginning of a contraction that's going to birth forth a, the final day, which is the day of the Lord. All right? He gave you the signs of the world. And then he talked about there will be a false messiah that will try to join the world together, seems to be, or bring that little solution to the world. And then he gave the signs in the church. The Bible actually talks about the great falling away, which means that uh, the days that we're living in is going to be so much pressure that people are going to leave their faith. He talked about the great falling away, yet he talked about the church is going to shine. Uh, and in that, in that journey, he encourages those who endure to the end. So there's this, this period of time where we need to learn how to endure. And he warns us of false prophets. These are the signs of the church. Then he gave the third signs. He says, signs in the Middle East. He talked about an abomination of desolation, uh, which is like an antichrist that's going to come. And he talked about there'll be some sign that's going to happen in the Middle East. And, and when we saw that, we know that uh, Christ is coming very near. And finally, he gave the fourth sign, which is a sign in the sky. So the Bible actually, Jesus gave them the four signs of his second coming so that we can be watchful. So he kept on telling them, be watchful, be prayerful. Then he went and then he ends Matthew 24 with this, uh, with verse 42. Let me read to you. He said, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord will come. But know this, that if the owner of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have let his house be broken into. Uh, therefore, you also must be ready. All right, turn to your neighbor and say, you must be ready. For in an hour when you least expect, the Son of Man is coming. Now, the million dollar question that you need to ask yourself, you can ask your neighbor, are you ready? When he comes again, turn to your person right, left and say, are you ready when Jesus Christ comes again? All right, so we're going to now zoom into the parables of the 10 virgin. You know, when we look at the parables, uh, there are uh, some, some people, they, they have this very uh, critic kind of a mind. They look at these parables, they're asking all kinds of questions. Why, why is there 10 virgin? You know, the virgin are really just the bridesmaid. Or some people, they have this weird way they are trying to interpret the entire passage by, uh, you know, talk about it came in the midnight, so they say that Jesus is going to come in night. Uh, you know, then it talks about, uh, you know, all this uh, and what is the oil and it means Holy Spirit. So, uh, but when you do parables, you actually don't have to overly interpret and, and make it allegorical. You don't have to because parables are designed with one simple truth that it wants to convey. This is a parable that warns you, are you ready? And that is the common theme of this parable. All right, so Matthew 25. That the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lambs and went to meet the bridegroom. Uh, five of them were foolish, five were wise. When, for when the foolish took their lambs, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lambs. Very simple scenario. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lambs, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lambs are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourself. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgin came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Underline that little phrase, I do not know you. So that relationship with God is so important. Watch therefore, which is the punchline of this entire parable, for you neither know the day nor hour. Are you ready for the coming 
of Christ. Now, four things you need to understand. Number one, the concept of wedding. <clears throat> All of us understand wedding. Uh, so Jesus used the metaphor of wedding in the Jewish custom. Uh, there are three stages. There's first of all the engagement. Then they got the betrothal. Betrothal is when they uh, just kind of promise each other and then they were given for about a year. When someone is betrothed and for one year, in this one year period, it's just like our engagement today. And then in that one year period, they, they get ready themselves. They work, they buy land, they plow the land, whatever it is. And then the day will come when they will get married. So obviously, in this case, it is the third stage where the bridegroom is going to go uh, to the bride's house and receive the bride and bring them back to the groom's house. You know, it's just like today, right? Uh, we are from Chinese culture. In fact, our Chinese culture is a big thing. Uh, you get all your, all, your, all your men, all your friends, you know, come along with you. And then you go to the girl's house. And then the sisters will make it really difficult. I think in Chinese, there's this word called chuangmen, you know, where you need to like almost force open the door <clears throat> so that you can get the, get the bride. And the sisters kind of make it difficult. You know, the the last few that I, that I observed was scary because uh, to get into the house, you must do things that's almost impossible. I think the last one that I saw was they have to eat worms, you know. Oh, so scary, okay. Uh, thank God I gotten married earlier. In fact, uh, mine was a little bit of a funny story. Uh, all the sisters kind of planned for something and I, and I kind of delayed the entire thing, you know. So when I arrived, I told Teresa, I said, uh, the wedding is going to start really. The people are waiting. I think we need to go. And uh, so, you know, so we played only at most one game and then, you know, then I managed to get Teresa. Okay, that's a little strategy, okay? Sneaky strategy, okay? By the way, when I look at that, right, you have the entire wedding, such a big thing. So now the groom is going to go and get the bride. The second thing you want to understand is the groom. The groom, the Bible clearly says, is Jesus Christ. is the one that's going to come back and get uh, us, you know, which is really the bride of Christ. The third one you want to know is the virgin. The virgin is really the bridesmaid. Uh, this is, has nothing to do with a sexual connotation or whatever. This is really bridesmaid that's with them. And in that bridesmaid, there were five that were ready. They have extra oil. The other five, they don't. And the fourth thing you want to know, oil. Oil is really the faith that we have in Christ, okay? Uh, I know that, that, that there are so many different interpretations for that, but really, when you think about that, is, is your faith, do you know God? Are you ready to meet uh, your Saviour? All right? And the warning is the entire goal of these parables. Now, the million-dollar question again is, are we ready to meet our Saviour, Jesus Christ? You know, I'm talking about two groups of people today. If you are tuning in and you do not know God, because ultimately Jesus says, I do not know you. So it goes back to your relationship with God. I'll come back to that later. But I'm talking about two groups of people. If you do not know God, I want to encourage you that you discover God. In fact, uh, I will give you a link where you can sign up where I take on people a journey to discover God. Uh, you know, ever since I started this, about maybe three years ago, I think I've seen about 40 people or more that has gave their life to Jesus or rededicated their life to Jesus uh, because in this journey of discovering God, it's a very neutral platform uh, where you get to talk about the God conversation as openly as possible. So if you have friends that you want to bring them, I want you to take note of the QR code. But if you are watching this, uh, you can just take a QR code and then join us. We'll contact you so that the next one, we get to do this together. But the second category of people that I'm talking to are those of you and I who knows God. The question to us is, are we ready? Uh, so, I want to end by giving you three simple uh, thoughts about how do we keep our relationship with God. You know, I, I have a relationship with my wife. I know my relation. I know my wife. My wife knows me. How do I know that? Because we talk, we converse. I think about her, she thinks about me. I, 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 I wanted to know how she feels. So there is a constant live relationship. Your relationship with God is also like that. Do you talk to Him? Do you feel that He impresses into your heart? Do you bother about Him? Do you go live and without thinking about, are you ready? So I want to give you three little words or give you a sentence made up of three little concepts and you can string them together. I'm going to call this uh, the way you know that you have a relationship with God has these three little expression: In Christ, with church, for good works. Let me repeat again and you can say it together with me. In Christ, with church, 
four good works. I want to encourage you that you want to live out these three little expressions. The word in Christ simply means you're embedded in Christ, just like I illustrated just now. I'm, I'm in my wife. My wife is in me because I think about her. When I try to make a decision, I, I try to make a decision that includes her when I, when I buy dinner because she's in me. I'm in her. So I say, oh, okay, you know, I, I will buy this because uh, she doesn't, she likes soupy stuff. Then I buy that because I take into consideration. Christ is like that. Do you take into consideration of how he feels? You know, the, the contrast of in Christ is the opposite is in sin. And I think that that can be very real. Some of us, we are embedded in sin. So when we make a decision, we try to think about a sinful thing that comes with that decision. You know, I want to encourage uh, this generation of people. I meet a lot of people who sometimes they are married person, they have, they have, uh, they have mistress. Uh, sometimes people who are not married, they stay together. And for them, uh, it's just normal. It's just common. That's what everybody does, right? But I want you to know that if you are in Christ, you give consideration to what Christ thinks about that. So you want to make sure you are in Christ. Number two, you are with community. You are with the church. You grow together. Hebrews 11 says, do not forsake the assembling of God's people. Something about when you stay, uh, there, are, there is an interaction with people of faith. They encourage you, they strengthen you, and you become stronger. Uh, D.L. Moody has a classic illustration. And this is what he said. He said when he met up with one of his church members, the church member replied, he says, I believe I can be just as good of a Christian outside the church that I can be inside it. Which means that this person hasn't showed up for a long time when Dial Moody met up with him. He says, no, I can be as good as this. So Dial Moody did this. He said nothing. Instead, he moved to the fireplace, blazing against the winter outside. He removed one burning coal, coal and placed it on the floor. The two men sat together and watched the ember die out. And then the man said, I got your point. You know, he went to this whole bunch of hot coal and he took one. He just left it outside for a while and both of them watched it together. You know, something about when you are with church, when you are in your live group and there are people encouraging you, it sets up an environment for you uh, not to walk away from God. Uh, not to be easily distracted by, I don't know, whatever the world throws in front of you. It was said that the Roman soldier, when they worked together as a unit, 16 of them, it is one of the most powerful battle unit. And, and it was said that 16 can take on about 50 to 60 or four times more size of a bandits. And one of the reasons they stick together so close that even though you are injured, because you are so close, you will never fall. You keep on standing and fighting together. You know, I always imagine this. Uh, when you have brothers uh, that stands together with you, when you have sisters that stands together with you, it gives you strength. It gives you focus. It gives you the energy so that you can run the race that God has set for you. And finally, four good works. Not only you enjoy who God is, not only you enjoy each other, you learn how to take what God has given you and be faithful. You want to plow it back to the kingdom of God, your talents. Uh, serve God, the Great Commission, love people, uh, care for others. You know, all these things keep you uh, right, hot and sharp in the things that God has for us. I want to end with a little final story. Uh, this story happened when I was about 9 or 10 years old. And I can remember clearly and vividly because it was one of those instances that kind of left a mark in my life. So I went uh, for a chess competition and I was about 10 years old, I think. And I still remember I went to this school called Convent School. And it was a Saturday. Uh, my parents put me into the bus scholar, uh, sent me to the school. And while waiting after, every, after the entire event, while waiting for the bus, I needed to go to the toilet. I went to the toilet. When I came out, I saw the school bus left in front of me. I want you to know that I chased and shouted and screamed at the school bus, but it just sped away. Now, and I kind of walked back to the school. I was crying. I was 10 years old. I was crying because I felt like I'm not going to see my parents. Who is no, no handphone? My house has no phone. And you know, I I the entire emotion of feeling being left out. I didn't make it to that school bus it was so real. It was so scary. It was so daunting. 
I came back, I was crying and everybody was trying to comfort me, but they were all kids as well. They were looking at me until one parent uh, came by and trying to find out what happened and then, and then tried to help me up. And eventually, the, the parents is the one that sent me home. You know, when I think through the entire incident, sometimes, you know, I still remember that a couple of years ago, I was sleeping and I, I, I had a dream of that particular incident. And I can shudder at it. Because that feeling of being missed and not be able to catch on that bus uh, was so real emotionally. Now, you may look at it and say, Pastor, but that's so stupid, right? I know. But I was young. And I know that you have those moments where you thought that you missed out on something and you regret it. But I want you to know that the Bible says when Christ comes back, are you going to be ready? If you are not, then you're going to miss that boat. You're going to miss that bus. You're going to miss the bridegroom coming uh, to get the bride. And the Bible says that once the door is shut, it will not be opened again. This parable warns every one of us, do not take our faith lightly. If you, if you are someone who do not know God, I want to encourage you, you can make a decision to say yes to God today. Uh, if you struggle, then I invite you to discover God. But for those of you who are ready to say yes to God, I want you to follow me in a simple word of prayer. It's a prayer to invite <clears throat> Jesus into your life so that He helps you to be ready when He comes at the final day of judgment. I want you to pray together with me. All right, a simple prayer. Say, Dear God, I know you are coming again. As one who will reward the righteous, and judges the unrighteous. I want to be ready to meet you. The way to do so is to receive you as my Lord and Saviour. Today, I make a decision to invite Jesus into my heart. Forgive my sin. Give me a fresh start. Teach me to trust in you. Lead me to do your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. But if you are a Christian and you know that you kind of potentially are cold, maybe you, you are a really a lone ranger Christian, I want to encourage you, change uh, and be part of a community of faith. Maybe you are in sin. You need to be in Christ. You need to ask God to forgive you and you come out from that, reach out for help. I want to pray for you, but you know what? At the end of this service, you can actually go to, there's a prayer Zoom ready for people to pray with you. I want to encourage you to do so. Uh, I'm going to close by praying for everybody so that we are ready when Christ comes back again. All right, let's pray. God, I thank you for today. Lord, this parable is a warning that we must be ready, that we do not take it lightly. We do not end up like the foolish virgin who never prepared to meet up with you. It is clear that nobody knows when you come, but when you come, you will come so suddenly. God, I pray, help us to always stay in Christ. Help us always to stay among the community of faith and help us to live our life about to do the will of God. Teach us to be disciples that is keen to always make disciples. Lord, I thank you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, be ready to meet your Saviour and your God in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tim, for that message. I'm astounded by the stories told by Jesus. It changed my life years ago, and I know it will do the same to you. So we've almost come to the end of Church Online, and before you go, you should know that with the advancements in technology, you can now give your tithes and offerings the 21st century style via QR Pay. So here's how you do it. Hello, Every Nation family. All right, so there are actually three ways you can give your tithes and offering: Check, bank transfer, and QR Pay. And today, I'll be teaching you how to use QR Pay. Let's get to it. First thing you need to do is take out your phones and open your QR scanner or camera app. Once you've done that, you scan the code on screen. This will bring you to this page and here you can see the amount, name and also the reference boxes. 
Tap on the amount box and type in the amount you want to give. Next, you select the name box and you type in your name. Moving on to the reference boxes, there are a few options. Tides, offering, mission giving, community giving, building pledges, love gift, and others. Here is where you indicate what you're giving for. The next box underneath is for you to specify what you're giving for. For example, if you have selected love gift previously, you can indicate who you're giving to. Or if you select the tight, you can specify for which month. But for this example, I'm going to leave it blank. And so, once you've done, you press send. This should bring you to this page. And on this page, there are four options. Alipay, Boost, GrabPay, and Touch and Go. For this example, I will be selecting Touch and Go. This should directly bring you to the app. On this page, you select Pay and enter your six digit PIN code. And you're done and you will be redirected back to the website. And that is how you give with QR Pay. Now you think giving is too simple? Well, you betcha. All right, so jerks aside. Speaking of stories, John 3.16, a very familiar verse to many of us, but it was as real a story that turned my life around. So in this verse, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So I learned two things that day. One, God gave everything for me. And the second is that giving is a condition of our hearts. So God gave because He loves. So I hope as you spend the rest of your weekend, you're reminded that you're worth everything for God and that He loves you. So we've come to the end of our service today. A couple of reminders before you go. Parents, do remember to save this new link and go there now at hgmd.la slash everynationkids to join Kids Church Online starting shortly. Then for the happening teens generation, let's proceed to Teens Live at 3 p.m. And if you're looking for a place to belong in this Every Nation family, check out one of the live groups for each generation after this. And for our Chinese Mandarin speaking folks, we'll see you at Gengxin Jiao Hui online service at 4 p.m. 四点钟哦,不要错过. And don't forget to invite your dads next weekend for a celebration with Pastor Russ Austin. See you soon. Goodbye from Every Nation Church Malaysia.